Numerous directors claim this valley. Uh, Bud Bettiger's uh, one that I love because of Randolph Scott. Um, actually, I'm back to doing what I originally started in this business. So it was Westerns. I just finished two of them for INSP. And it's a blatant um, commercial there uh, that'll be on this next year. And uh, really happy with them because they're making their own movies now. Um, and uh, so just celebrated that we just did a thing at uh, Disney uh, D23 for the 40th anniversary. It's been 40 years now since Tron came out. It'll be 41 years since we started making it. But um, yeah, it's amazing, Tron. Um, <laughs> kind of really, that's strange for me. <laughs> um, no, um, you know, that was a movie that, um, in fact, I was doing a Western at the time for NBC, a TV movie. Um, on the location, which I just left a week ago, uh, and uh, you know, outside of Arizona in Mescal, um, outside of Tucson, and I was reading this script that uh, got sent to me in the mail. By then, there was no emails or any of that kind of thing, certainly in 1980, 1979, in fact. And um, I couldn't make any sense out of it. You know, this Tron business, what the heck is this? And um, somewhere, a Wrangler has in the saddlebags an original script of Tron, because I looked at this thing, I said, I, I'm not interested in this at all. I was so in cowboy mode at that time, playing Wyatt Earp, in fact, young Wyatt Earp. And I put it in the saddlebag, and I never looked back. And um, I didn't think about this thing until I got back to Los Angeles. And then they said, well, they want to see you. They're very interested in you. And I said, why? And then when I found out, the man you mentioned, Jeff Bridges, was doing it. I, you know, you always kind of check out the people that were doing it, and he was kind of an inspiration to me. Jeff, his work at the time, being a, a peer, we're on the same age, and so um, I said, "Was well, he's going to do it?" Well, yeah, that was the real reason why I wanted to do it. And uh, but who am I? You know, this was the hubris of youth. Um, I'm going. They're offering you a part in a Disney movie. And you're going, you're even questioning, you know? But I did, I did accept it. I went and visited them and they showed me some, um, some cells and stuff that they had already done. And I kind of thought to myself, well, I'll get, I'll begin to understand and I'm sure as we get into this thing. And you know, it was a great experience. And Jeff was wonderful, David Warner, who sadly we just, just passed a few months ago, a couple months back. And um, uh, so, but, the strange thing about it is, is that it's still going. This movie came out lackluster, basically a dud in 1982, in a summer full of big science fiction blockbusters, the birth of the blockbuster, you know. And um, yeah, it, uh, and suddenly I'm still 40 years later talking about this movie. No other job do you talk about so much, you know, um, and, um, but I'm glad I did it, and I'm glad people still like it. It actually is the, kind of the science fiction in its naive little story. It's kind of predicted the world we're living in. You know, first of all, not only video game world, which is lifelike looking now, you know, cinematic looking, but also the age of information and the internet. So it predicted all those things in a strange little way, you know. Technology was groundbreaking, and surprisingly, most people, I don't like to burst any bubbles, but there was only a few minutes of CG in it. CG, it was called computer graphics. But the geniuses of uh, uh, Richard, who I got a few weeks back, um, uh, Richard Taylor and Harrison Ellenshaw and uh, numerous others, they were these whiz kids that Disney took a chance on. And Steven Lisberger, most of all, whose creation this was, it was a kid from Boston. I think he came out and had this script he'd written. And he, was, he had done commercial work in Boston area, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And Stephen uh, shopped it around, not unlike George Lucas did with Star Wars, only a few years earlier, shopped it around town and no one was interested. No one at all. I can understand it. When I first read the script, I had no idea what you're talking about. There were no computers. We didn't have computers. IBM had computers, you know? And, and those companies and things like that, and it was, they were wall-sized things, and, you know, and they had DOS, I guess, was the system at the time. And, uh, but I was totally blissfully unaware of all of it. 
um, I met Stephen, and uh, they were interested, and I accepted, and I'm so glad I did. Literally, Tron Legacy, its legacy is that it's a Disney franchise. It's not Marvel. It's not Lucas Films. It's not all those things that they've bought and carried on with. So it's a strange relationship because I've done everything Tron related that Disney has done. I did their animated series, killed us in 13 episodes. Why? I don't know. Um, we had a great cast, Eliza Wood, Eliza Wood, all these wonderful people. And uh, um, it was great. So then I also did the video games, Tron 2.0. I did Kingdom Hearts, the only time my youngest son ever thought his father was cool. As I, was, I remember him as a little boy going, Dad, Dad, do you know that Tron is in the Kingdom Hearts video game, Disney? I said, yeah, I did the voice. Oh, cool. You know, that was the only time I was ever cool. Everything else, was, I'm just Dad. We were in uh, Edinburgh, and uh, I'm standing in front of this huge cathedral that says Tron on it. And uh, apparently in uh, Gaelic, or, or uh, that they speak, um, Scotch-Irish, uh, that's, that's the word for church. I, um, there was a script that um, Joe Kaczynski, who now has directed the most, the biggest, uh, largest film in history right now, um, uh, Top Gun Maverick, he, he, and, he fell in during Legacy with, uh, with Tom Cruise over two movies, a wonderful science fiction movie he did called Oblivion with Tom Cruise. Top Gun Maverick, I guess, has reached a billion dollars. Yeah. Goodbye Avatar, goodbye all of them. He left it behind with his afterburner there. In fact, yesterday we were riding when I was supposed to be doing this with you, or yesterday, I, I, I turned to uh, my friend Rob Ward and I said, you think World War III has started? The jets, they, they were dogfighting up there above us all morning yesterday. There were jets going by. We've got a number of military bases in the vicinity. I thought maybe we didn't, I didn't look at the news this morning. Has it begun? <laughs> you know, but Top Gun was happening above us, that's for sure. And they were turning and burning right above us, and I, and I had to block out the sun with my hand, and I could just see that guy turn it, and he, he, oh man, it was amazing. And they are fighting each other. Yes, they are. Well, we need them to, <laughs> in case the real day comes. I went to the Goodman Theater uh, School of Drama in 1968. Um, on a probationary program. I was not the best student in the world, but I knew what I wanted to do at a very early age, just didn't know how to do it. And then Chicago is where I left home to go to. That was the big city. And um, a teacher had helped me get in to this uh, prestigious drama school, which later became, went over to uh, DePaul University. But that was after I had left it already. But for three years I worked, uh, learned my trade, to be a repertory actor, you know, in regional theater and stuff like that. That's what, what basically, and, and they had a professional company there, so we were always uh, uh, in the vicinity of real working actors, and you could always, you know, and I worked on the stage crew there, and we had a, a student theater in the same complex of the, the um, uh, what was it, the Art Institute of Chicago on Michigan Avenue, and, um, big underground complex at theaters and everything. It was an amazing place. And now it doesn't exist. They've moved it. Uh, the Goodman Theater is a professional theater, but it's over on Dearborn Street in the middle of the loop now. But um, it was once a massive, beautiful house. And um, I eventually got in their company as a student. Uh, I graduated from that and got into professional. And then um, I auditioned for a play at another playhouse in Chicago. and. Uh, to be an understudy to a guy, young guy that uh, didn't know at the time was going to be fired. And so within two to three weeks, I suddenly was taking his job. And that took me to Washington, D.C., the arena stage, and then ultimately to New York on Broadway with it. So um, uh, I started my theatrical career that way. I did summer stock. I did all that sort of thing. And um, it was on the summer stock tour that I uh, got me out of Manhattan that summer. It was a sweltering place. And um, these people in the, uh, it was Paul Lind. Do you remember who Paul Lind was? At that time, he was the center square of Hollywood squares. And it, sh and it showed me the power of television. 
We, we had played at a theater, a terrible little play. It was just basically a setup of everybody setting Paul up with, we'd be the straight man to his gag lines, you know, I mean, which he was famous for, infamous for. And um, in Atlanta, we had 3,000 people one night show up to the Theater of the Stars to see this stupid little thing called My Daughter is Rated X. But, and not, and not that he had any influence, but it was the people that were his, like his entourage, they kept saying, you know, you should go to Hollywood. You'd do well out there. And it kind of planted the seed of what I always dreamt about. And, um, and then I thought, you know what? I went back to New York. The play that I had done in Chicago that we took to Broadway um, had opened and closed. It um, was one of, probably one of my first really great lessons in show business. Everyone's telling you how great you are, kid. Don't sign the first contract they give you. You hold out a year, nothing less than a year contract, kid. You're going to be a big star, kid. Um, opening night was our closing night. We had been, you know, uh, a week uh, out of town tryouts, and then we had uh, a week of previews on, in New York on Broadway, and um, we took this beautiful little play I started in Chicago and a little in the round theater, put it up on this great big proscenium stage from a, you know, an arena stage to the proscenium, and uh, somehow it got lost. But another young guy was in that thing. I don't know whatever happened to him. His name was Ted Danson. I don't know. Yep. Guy got lost somewhere, I guess. He's a bartender somewhere in Boston, I think, still. But anyway, uh, Ted and I see each other once in a while. We just did uh, Seth MacFarlane's um, uh, TV show on Hulu, uh, The Orville, science fiction. It's kind of a knockoff on Star Trek, kind of homage to all that. And Ted was on there. So once in a while we see each other and realize it was that long ago, 1971, wow. 72 maybe. I turned 21 in New York City. But long story short, I decided I'm going to the West Coast. I auditioned for a lot of things, but um, I wasn't really a triple threat, a singer, dancer, actor. And in New York, you really got to have all of that because of the predominance of musicals and things like that and Broadway, you know. And at that time, musicals were huge. I went back and did that same play in Chicago again, where it was a resounding success, made my money for eight weeks and bought a one-way ticket to Los Angeles. I had never been to Los Angeles before, but I did get an agent out of the whole experience in New York, and they said, if you do decide to go out to the West Coast, which one of the agents in that, in that agency said, you should go to the West Coast. This, this is wrong for you here. I said, and it's really not what I want to do. I don't want to be a song and dance man. I want to act. I want to be on TV. And by God, I did it. I went... Uh, Took me only two years to get my first um, job on the Mary Tyler Moore show, and then I went to Gunsmoke. I did the last Gunsmoke shot in 20 years. I saw myself on that. I went promptly to acting classes in LA. I was mortified by the fact that I was not a TV actor yet. I was I was playing to the hundredth row. I was everything was big. I was way too big for the cap. But that was another lesson. That lesson I learned on Broadway, when all those old hands told me everything was going to be cool, uh, that you're going to be great. Don't ever believe anybody because the audience decides that, and the audience didn't. You know, that season in New York, no one was coming to the, it sounds very familiar to today. It was crime ridden, uh, the area, Broadway, the theaters, it was a dangerous place to go. And um, so, kind of sadly, it's kind of reliving that again. Actually, in, in many ways, I mean, Hollywood's still there, but don't, not necessarily anymore. Uh, other states and other peoples realized they could do the same thing. These two westerns I just did was an outfit out of um, out of North Carolina, not beholden to Hollywood whatsoever. And they're doing great. It's INSP, station INSP that plays Gunsmoke and all the movies and everything. And now they're making their own movies, and it's going to make its cable premiere the first one I did for them, so uh, and this next year. Um, anyway, uh, everything's streaming now. It's all about streaming. It's a whole new industry now. That is, all of this that we're sitting in is a museum to when they used film. We don't use, no one uses film anymore. It's digital, and, you know. Uh, it's, um, 
It's almost like the transition from silence to sound. It's changed that radically. So we don't need to be in Los Angeles anymore. Frankly, I'm, uh, my wife and I are planning to move out of California. I just, too many people and it's, you know, I never thought I'd ever say that because that dream to go to California was so strong in me. But I've lived there 50 years, probably around there. The theater is where, um, and I haven't been back since, by the way. So don't get me wrong on this. I mean, I still tell, uh, when asked that question, and I am once in a while asked that, that um, the, the roots of, for the actor is the stage, the live stage. You have to learn your craft there. Or you'll never be, I mean, a lot of these ladies and gentlemen we saw here, none of them were in the theater. And they started in early movies and, you know, um, I don't believe Roy was a theater actor or, or Gene, any of this. And they learned, they played a persona that they played. You're talking about Tom Hanks. Tom, I can tell, was rooted in the theater. He must have. I've never asked him on that. Um, I met him originally when he was uh, still doing uh, Bosom Buddies. And um, we were at a People's Choice Awards, and I was doing Scarecrow and Mrs. King at the time with Kate Jackson. And we were going to be presenting, and I'll never forget, he introduced, we're standing off the wings of the theater, waiting to be uh, announced to come on to announce whatever category we were going to present. And um, he says, hey, I'm t Tom, Tom Hanks. I say, yeah, yeah, what are you? He says, listen, tell me something. How do you guys do this every week? Because he was doing, remember he was doing a show about two guys disguising themselves as uh, women, wearing cl women's clothes. I wanted to ask him, how do you do that every day? Um, but he, uh, he, uh, he says, how do you action guys do it every week? And the irony just falls on my head going, the action guys? This is a guy who stormed Omaha Beach and now, you know, and was cast away on a raft. I mean, you're asking me now, you know, back then. I think he did a pretty good job with the action and adventure and all those things that he's done. I mean, he's such a versatile actor, but he's done, you know, how did you land a plane in the Hudson River? You know, Scully, you know, Sully or whatever his name was, remember? But um, I, look to, I still look to guys like that as inspirations. I think you never, uh, never get tired of insp inspiration by other actors, you know? And uh, I just found that funny that back then I was running around saving the free world in the Cold War days with, uh, with Kate Jackson by my side, you know, secret agents. So um, I would ask him now, how did you get from Bosom Buddies to Omaha Beach and Saving Private Ryan, you know, and Apollo 13 and all every great movie? He doesn't do a bad movie. Such a good job of it, yeah. Yeah, and he's always, like, he's our, he, I would say probably if there is that sort of, in a way he's kind of what I, always thought Jimmy Stewart was. So American, you know, he's not British. He's not, there's none of that influence. He's so like a middle American guy and is so versatile in that, but he portrays us to the world better than anybody. I really believe that he's, no matter what role he plays, um, he's just kind of got that um, common sense. If, if you've met him, then you know that that's, the way he is, his yes. personality. Am I it's not just, right? Yeah. It's whether you turn the camera on or off. He is uh. just as great, you know. Yeah. And he doesn't. It, he isn't influenced by who the people are. Yeah. Just anybody, yeah. you know. He's yeah. just. I, I think it's he's a he's a heck of a guy. I haven't. I saw him one other time. It was at a, an anniversary. It was at the thirtieth for um, the Apollo thirteen, and he was there in his castaway look. He was still shooting castaway, and he had those dreads. He had these long things and he was so thin and I just got to say hi to him and we recalled that night at the People's Choice Awards and laughed about the irony of it all. <laughs> and didn't didn't he have to go through a whole routine to lose all that weight? Yes, he and did. Then, then he came back six months later. For the same picture, he had yeah. to gain the weight back. Exactly. Too. Yeah. yeah, it was one way or the other. He either did the island stuff. First. No. Or no, no, he did all the yeah. previous. Then they took six months where he went through intensive dieting and, and workout and everything like that to get himself down to that. Then they went back to shooting. Boy, what a luxury. I'm a TV guy. I may have done some motion pictures, you know, big ones, a couple of them, but I'm basically a television guy and 
I've never had that wonderful luxury of being able to do, like get it really fit shape for some role. Because generally in television, the, um, the deal is made a week before you actually go to, you know, they're finally done where it's a real, a real job. And uh, television, you have very little time. So you have to try to grab that kind of keep yourself camera ready and, ca and looking good for the camera too. You know, it's important. Scarecrow and Mrs. King was a marvelous experience. Uh, did, uh, it's now 39 years ago. It was right, I, I had done Tron. And then I did a brief series for a season, uh, uh, one season, it was a, a, a sort of Indiana Jones type thing called Bring Them Back Alive. It was on CBS on Monday nights. And I came in number two to the 10th season of Happy Days. And it was, a, you don't know what that would juggernaut that thing was. It was hard to try to knock them off. And back in those days, when there was only three networks, your job was to be number one. And CBS wanted that time slot number one so bad on, a, I think it was Tuesday nights at eight o'clock. And my show was uh, my first opportunity. I'd been under the shadow of James Arnett and all that with how the West was won and all of that. So it was my turn. CBS took a chance on me and, and we created this uh, uh, sort of pre-World War II, 1930s. He was an actual ca uh, historical character, Frank Buck. He was a, not a big game hunter. He actually, and ecologically and con conservation-wise, he was a perfect character because most of our big zoos in America were created by what he brought back from the exotic places of the world to preserve animals. He saved the white rhino that was going into stink, uh, uh, um, you know, was about to die out in India and places like that. But he was an adventurer. He wrote many, many books. He did Columbia serials where he acted in them. He had Bring Him Back Alive and a whole bunch of things back in the 1930s. And we kind of made him an Indiana Jones type character. So I didn't, long story short, I didn't, uh, they said, don't worry about it. We're going to find you something better. And uh, I got hooked up with uh, Kay Jackson. And um, we did Scarecrow and Mrs. King uh, for four seasons, which was a, a kind of a rom-com adventure story. And eight o'clock wise, it was, you know, safe for everybody. Um, and that was kind of in, in line with, it was also, I think Remington Steele had come on one season before us. And uh, there was Heart to Heart started. It was kind of the couples, you know, the Cary Grant and um, Catherine Hepburn type uh, shows, uh, movies uh, only made for television with, you know, uh, we weren't allowed to get married. And then when we did, our ratings went down. <laughs> so I don't know what that says, but, um, you know, that type of thing. And that lasted four seasons because, uh, unfortunately, Katie became ill and had to quit. So but it was and, fun working with her. Always of all. You know, we had, you know. We had that kind of quippy kind of dialogue. And I, I realized I could do that light comedy, I think, you know, pretty good. I, and um, she was certainly the greatest partner in that because she, she, was, she, was, she was a brilliant actress. She really was. She also directed a couple episodes. And I think she would have gone on if she chosen to, had chosen to, to go on and be a, a wonderful director. Penny Marshall was doing it at the time. And there was a number of women coming in. Uh, taking over those things. And uh, so, but that, you know, then Tron came out and um, I remember going to see it and I said, I am convinced now I'm never going to be a movie star. So I went, and that's when I went, I was obviously bring it back alive and then Scarecrow and Mrs. King. So 1982 was a big year for me. And, um, and then you ended up back in science fiction again. Yes, I did. Yeah, I've been very fortunate since the 70s to have a, being involved in a series or, you know, for every decade, 70s, 80s, 90s. And now I'm considered a uh, retro star, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. Um, yeah, and then um, uh, I had a period there. I did a lot of TV movies. Remember, that was a very prominent uh, miniseries came in. I did East of Eden. I did all kinds of wonderful um uh, Actually, How the West was One started as a miniseries. That was in the 70s. We followed Roots, which was the biggest event at the time for television. So um, our opening on, on How the West was One, I played um, James Arness's nephew, his non-gunsmoke role. He got to do another Western. It was at MGM. 
So I was sort of under the auspices of MGM then at the time. It wasn't really a, like a, uh, you know, like they did with stock players or stuff, you know, that I wasn't under contract of them, but I was more or less do MGM things, you know. Um, and so I, I remember that studio. Now it's long gone. It's basically a paper studio now. It's not really. But um, so I got to see the end of the old system, the new system that was knocking it down. I mean, I auditioned for Star Wars, didn't make that, but that's why I took Tron right away when I saw the, it's not Star Wars, but it kind of looks like it, only it's inside of a, okay, I'll do it, you know, that type of thing. But um, so, you know, uh, there were a lot of changes going on at that time. And then television, as we were, we were talking earlier, is going through a big change now. This happens, you know, with technology drives it too, you know. These cameras, they're not, they're, li they're littler than the ones I started out with, those big, Big ones, the thirty-five mils and things. And like that. the uh, the pixel ratings and stuff on it's yeah. getting more and more like film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yes. Look back on all this now, and see that what I was unaware of. When you're going through, you're not aware of. You're just busy, always trying to go on further. There, there were mistakes I made, and there were. I have no re real regrets anymore. I mean, things that I uh, maybe had the opportunity didn't grab at. But if you do that, you'd go nuts, you know. We all have that in life. That's just life. My 70s now, I mean, most of the, my heroes, they'd have been retired or dead. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm three years older than you are, and that's it. And, um, you know, you're kind of looking at that, but um, I don't want to retire. I'm segueing. I'm, I've, these two Westerns I've done are wonderful character roles. I don't look a thing like what I look like now. I just shaved the beard off and the, everything, and... Um, you know, my father's still alive. God bless him. My father is still alive. My father and mother, they're in their 90s. And my father is still restless. Retirement's not been good. Right. Now he can't golf and things like that. But, you know, they're wonderful. And But I, I, under, I see my father and I see myself, probably, if I li should be blessed to live that long. You've got to fill it up with hobbies and things like that. But, but uh, what I'm saying in our business, I, I, I don't... I'm looking around at my contemporaries that are still around. There's a lot gone, and we've lost quite a few of them in the last couple of years, as as the world. But the business has lost a lot of people, and um, I just think that um, it's not really necessary to retire. I don't I don't want the workload that I used to have to do. That's a younger man's game. Television, you have to have youth. It's a grueling, still a grueling. Uh, wonderful uh, experience but it's it's you know it's hard work you're doing 14 hour 15 hour days you know especially back when i was doing it um, friday always became saturday morning and then they have you back monday morning bright and early for to start the week over again but you always carried over i know scarecrow and mrs king we were getting out at one or two o'clock in the morning and they could do turn turnaround we had to have a turnaround of how many hours and uh, and I when I talked to the old timers before me, um, my God, it was a lot, lot more. When they did thirty six episodes a season, you know, and things like that, we were doing twenty two. Now a series is ten episodes. <laughs> I can't believe that. That would have been we'd have just been getting started at ten episodes when I was doing it. And I sound, I'm not. A, I feel like an old fogey talking like this. But in my day, son. We did 22 on the air, and you got you got 13 pickup. Then you waited what we called the back nine, and you waited for that. You hoped for the back nine. At 13, you were probably going off the air. They didn't want to spend any more money on you. You know that means you were gone. You play out your string, and that'd be it. So so quick. Television is truly the and and generally I. If I hear some motion picture star whining about what a grueling schedule you had doing one page in a week, I did 10 pages to, or more a day of dialogue, action, all that stuff on a weekly television series. That's a, that's a good question. I have found that the really good professional actors mm -hmm. have a really good memory and that you can look at a script I used to be able to. And, <laughs> no, I do. I mean, 
I, I do now, but I have to really, when I was in my 30s, 40s, 30s and 40s, 20s certainly, but 30s and 40s after having done all that for over a decade and more, I could spot, I could look at that script page and have it in five, 10 minutes. I'd have everything on it and I'd know your lines too. I had to, you know, um, Katie was the same way. Scarecrow and Mrs. King was probably, and I have to say the biggest, my most successful thing I ever did. Science fiction is a niche audience. It's not a general audience. Um, Westerns are sort of a niche audience too. Um, more bigger than even sci-fi. Now sci-fi has taken over just about everything. Babylon 5, I did that. Uh, I replaced, uh, I was always like the a pitch hitter. I'd be sitting there waiting to, you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna run this guy. He's not gonna hit. So put in Box Lightner, and you'll get a hit, you know. So, and I don't mean that as a braggadocious way, but I was very lucky to. Babylon Five was a, uh, I don't even know what you'd call it. Cable it wasn't even cable. It was a, it was called the P10 network, and I think it was on, in Los Angeles on UPN 13, and um, but it was on scattered times throughout the country, and thus even overseas. Uh, it be, could be on at five o'clock in the afternoon in, uh, in uh, New York and be at one in the morning on Sunday in uh, Texas or something. Or it was like scattered times where when you did network television, it was on that time zones, you know, but it was on just consistently the same across the country. If it's an eight o'clock show, whatever time zone you're in, it's on at eight o'clock or what have you, you know what I'm saying. Um, and it wasn't that way. Anyway, it was groundbreaking. Um, and the first season, there was some uh, problems with the leading man, the leading guy in it. And they decided, Warner's decided that they wanted to replace him. And I had done Scarecrow and Mrs. King for Warner's and Bring Him Back Alive over there at Warner's. So um, they, I think they made some offers around to some other actors. They were turned down. And I saw it at the time was a chance because I was having to go out of the, go to Canada. This is when Canada started taking a lot of our work was going north. And so I was, these movies of the week, that genre which died not too long after that, the MOWs, the Women in Jeopardy's movies, you know, I was always playing a bad husband or, you know, a serial killer or something like that. So I looked at an opportunity. I got to stay home in California. I got to sleep in my own bed every night. And this, um, that was, and I had just gotten married to actress, um, Melissa Gilbert. At the time, we were married for a dozen years. Little yeah, House. Little House in the Prairie. Yep, yeah. and um, we had uh, met, and uh, everything was going great. And I thought, you know what? I'm so tired of having to leave to go to work and then come home, be gone weeks at a time, hotels. And I know that I don't mean to sound whiny, but I would ask the average person, how would you like to be not in your house for four or five weeks sometimes at a time? And if there were a number of them. You could be gone months. And um, so that, and then this thing, I kind of looked at I, I saw they sent me some tapes. Remember that old? <laughs> A tape. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, of, of the first season, I said, well, I'd seen the show once, and all these Star Trek spinoffs were happening. Next Generation, uh, Voyager, all these things. And I noticed there was a distinct difference between Star Trek, uh, which was a, a Paramount, and it was uh, Star Trek was a very optimistic, always going to the new frontier. It was brightly lit. And I'm talking technical stuff here because that's tone. What is it? You know, everyone is brightly lit. It was uh, whereas I saw this show Babylon Five it took place on a space station, and it was a sort of a Casablanca in outer space. A mixing where all these different peoples came, as sort of the UN in its day and, and Casablanca, but it could be a dangerous place too. And it was a big five mile long thing and thousands of people and various races. So it had a, but it was dark. It had a dark tone to it. It was lit. There were back alleyways and, and it was the brown sector, which you didn't go down there unless you carried a phaser or a knife. And it was where trading was done and, and all kinds of, uh, you could be kidnapped. And, and, I, and the, the role I came in was as the military commander of that station. So it was a, it was a Fort Apache, the UN and Casablanca all rolled into one. 
And, um, and I read it and I went, and then I looked at it and I said, wow, this maybe this could be something I could get into. And, um, and, I, and I'd worked with the producer on a Sam Elliott Western in 1979 that um, I was on that and, and he was executive producer on this. And um, he said, I want Box Lightner. And he went to bat for me. Warner said, yeah, perfect. Everything came together there. And it was nice. And, um, and I started to work on that. And the original mission of that show was to go five seasons. Because back then in television, that would give us 100 episodes. And then you could go into syndication with it. There is no syndication anymore. We don't do that. So that's why we have 10 episode series now. In, in, in the streaming world. So um, I did that. I enjoyed it so much. Uh, I got to create a character from a young officer to a, a guy that eventually rode off over the had dedicated, had, had given his life for everybody to an alien race that I would be able to fulfill my mission, but I had to give 20 years of my life. So I literally got to create a character from a young man to an older man. Uh, uh, from everything, from comical things to very dramatic and, and action-filled. It all took place on this soundstage. I think we had one location shoot. It was in the parking lot um, of the place out in Sun Valley, and they threw some sand down, and they took a close-up of one of our characters looking up into a sky with a CGI fleet of these awesome ships going over. That was our own one location shoot. <laughs> you know, otherwise, in outer space, you know, we created that out of plywood and, you know, we had people from NASA would come out when they were going to J JPL over there in Pasadena, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They were inspired by it. We actually had a ship that our creator, J. Michael Straczynski, dreamed up. It was an X-wing type of thing. And NASA was actually interested at one time in maybe making something like that as a work platform for tools and things like that that astronauts could use outside the space station. They could fly around. They had all these little shht, shht, take you all these different directions. It would little spray out this way. would make you go left. And the pilot would be in the middle working on things, and he'd have all of his tools instead of on his suit, in counter suit, you know, he would be having uh, there, and they could, hey, we're interested in all kinds of things. And actually, it was a fighter jet that we used it as. And... Um, but it was a great show, and now they're talking about a reboot of it for, um, I think Warner Brothers is going through a series of re uh, changes right now. But yeah, Well, I think my character, I could not, it's, they're going to do it. Reboot means you're going to uh, reimagining. But we've, unfortunately, we've lost like six of our cast, the original cast already, uh, passed away. It's really hard on me to do that too, and and, and they, um, but the remainder of us, about four of us left, um, they would we would maybe have some other role, or, uh, you know, that, that we would appear because I know fan base loves that kind of thing when they see somebody. But I couldn't play Captain Sheridan anymore. I think he's going to be like twenty years old or something like that. Now I hope the thing goes forward. I say there are changes going on with the CW and um, Warner's right now, so we'll see what happens. Um, but I, I might want to return to that uh, in another character. We've already discussed things like that. So. You know, it's like Tron keeps coming back. And when you asked me earlier if Tron, Tron, um, um, certainly I, if they wanted me to do something, I certainly I would, because why not? It's something I've done now. It's been, it's, I told young Garrett Hedlund when we were doing Tron Legacy, I said, you know, Garrett, you're kind of the torch is being passed to you. He played Jeff Bridges' son in the thing. And uh, I said, but um, this title is kind of apropos, isn't it? Tron Legacy. Um, and Garrett, Tron is part of my legacy. So don't screw it up. <laughs> I said to him, I meant it too. Don't screw this up, you know, because it is my legacy, you know. I think, um, especially with the youngest generations, um, it's very maybe the older generations still kind of think it's, you know, rubber heads and things like that, but the young ones don't. In fact, it is predominant, I think, now. It's amazing how science fiction is the... 
I mean, even with the Marvel comics, which I personally call science fiction, it's a comic book. Um, superhero, superhero stuff. stuff. Yeah. So I, I, I don't look at it that way. Science fiction is something that makes you think like you did it. Oh, come on. They could never do it. Well, could they? Maybe they can happen. Now all this talk of going to Mars and, and to the moon again, I think that's very exciting. But what drives that? Because what I was saying earlier, we had some of the, the, uh, uh, the shuttle program guys come out and they wanted to visit our set. And I'd be sitting there talking with, uh, I knew two of the female um, pilots on, on the shuttle program and they were always welcome to come out. Our, one of our actors was dating one of them in our show. But anyway, I would always ask them and say, um, you know, he said, look, Mr. Boxleiter, Hollywood, you all create the dream. We get inspired by things we saw in the movies and stuff. Now we're going to try to do that for real. And we are. Look, we've gone through the, sh the space shuttle program, basically the covered wagon of the space way, uh, uh, adventure that we're about to go. We're going back to the moon, it looks like. I, I, I hope I'm around to see that again because I remember the excitement of it as I, when I was a boy. You know, you were there too, the Mercury, the, you know, uh, Gemini and Apollo. And then that, that wonderful day in July of 1969, when he said those words, you know, one small step for mankind. I mean, wow, one giant leap for mankind. So, I mean, there are people that have to believe we never did that. How could they, how could thousands and thousands of people who worked on that program, those programs to get those guys up there, yeah, and you look back at the technology. I remember I got to know Buzz Aldrin. In fact, I have one of his helmets when he was. Uh, I have one in there also, the one that did the, the, the pictures. He drew the pictures afterwards. He was one of those that went around. No, that was Al Schmidt or Al something. No, Alan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bean. I've got to sign books. Yeah. Yeah, he was actually he came back and. Uh, that's why I love, uh, I've, I've come to know over the years of Bill Shatner, William Shatner. And I was so excited when he went up in the, uh, yeah. in the horizon. Um, so you, you knew him personally? Oh, I know him. I do conventions with him once in a while and everything. He's a great guy. But it took an actor to actually go up. But always what we lacked when anybody went into outer space was the articulate, the articulation of the human experience of doing it. And Bill came down. And he started telling in a very, and he started crying. He was so moved by it, but it took him to describe what it felt like, weightlessness and all, and who better than Captain Kirk? Because that's what we know him as, you know, for generations now. And we always had technicians that went into space and they described it technically, but not in what a human being can relate to, you know? And it took an actor to do that. I was there when John Glenn made his, uh, uh, shuttle flight at 84 um, and I was there when he came down I was in at Cape uh, at the Cape when he came, when he landed and that was exciting and remember he he said when he got up into space that he was as physically active as any 25 year old because in outer space there's no gravity on you and your muscles and everything if you keep them exercised you know they exercise up there and everything keep from atrophying he was as good as any other, a younger human being. So um, maybe there's help for this. But I remember Buzz Aldrin confronting this guy that was hounding him. I, and I just cheered when I saw him. He just decked that guy right in the face, man. How dare he say it was all done on a sound stage? How dare the men that died on Apollo, the first Apollo died on the capsule. I mean, on the, remember they, they burned to death up there? It was a fire in the capsule. How dare they? All the sacrifice, they took everything out, and this guy and his camera crew went around hounding Buzz Aldrin about it, and Buzz just took it as a gentleman that he is, but until a point, and then he just turned around and spied that guy so hard. And knowing Buzz, it was so in character, you know. Anyway, but, I mean, if they asked me, I would love to. No, it's been good, and, and now I'm back kind of full circle. I'm... Uh, I'm doing westerns again, and that's my true love. Do you remember the the like the arts building where they had those two lions? Out yeah, that's the that's the Art Institute of Chicago. 
Mm-hmm. My mom was born just a little ways from that. A bit of that. I have only yeah. been there once, and I've seen the lions. But yep. I just had the big to make- lions are out front there, yeah. Yeah. And it was connected back. There was a, a, a lower section in the Art Institute, and we were connected to the Goodman Theater by a tunnel. Uh, not that far, not a big tunnel, but it was uh, underground. And um, and then on Monroe Street, which is the street uh, right next to it, on the other side was this beautiful theater entrance, and you went down. Pardon me? You went down, and it was a magnificent, grand uh, theater down there. And that's where I went to school. I didn't go to university. I went right from high school to that. And that's what I wanted to do. It was a very tumultuous era. That was during the Vietnam War. Um, uh, the, the Chicago was an epicenter of the anti-war riots and stuff like that. It was, when I look back, it was a pretty exciting time, but it was just a daily thing, you know, going to and from school. So, but um, anyway, I'm kind of, that's, yeah, long with, a long way from the Goodman Theater, you know, and I'm very proud of it. I just think, I think the, for basics, going all the way back to the beginning of this interview, the basics for an actor is that's where you have to carry it. There's no cut. Let's do that one again from another angle. Once the curtain goes up, it's the actor's show. All the directing, all the, everything else is you're the spotlight. It's on you. And no one can yell, okay, let's take scene five again. Let's do it, you know, faster this time. No, it's all up to you. You've got an audience there, you know, and and also it also helped in a very basic acting thing. Theater is, um, it's not realistic. It's, um, I don't, for want of a better word, um, it's kind of metaphorical and things. So as an actor, your job oftentimes is to create for the audience sitting before you an image. You're looking at something. It's not physically really there. Or, you know, but you, you've got to create it with your instrument. Create that visualization for them. What you're, I'm looking out over something. Well, no, there's an audience there, but I've got to imagine I'm looking out. Maybe I'm standing on a building or a top of it, and we're looking out over something and describe it to the audience. That's the art of acting. And it is important when you're a screen actor. Do you know how many space battles I fought to a black screen? with white pieces of tape and how I had to visualize that as an oncoming warship coming at us and discre- with all the trepidation or whatever. That's where theater comes in handy because it's not really there. And especially in all these science fiction things, they don't come in until after you're long done shooting and, and they're now the wizards of the technical world come in there and create that imagery, you know, CGI. If I might interject here, yeah. like in Jurassic Park. Yeah, um, there are no dinosaurs there. At, there. Yeah, there's a guy wearing a thing, a, he- a hat or a helmet, you know, it looks like it. To get, Maybe. So the actors know who to look or at. Or it's a stick or with something in the guy's, because you're having to look up at the uh, dinosaurs or whatever in Jurassic. And they're going by with something. You're looking at them. There it is. It's Tyrannosaurus. And he's going, it's, it goes back to the very basics of storytelling as an actor. And um, all the way back to the silent films, you know, where they, they talk, okay, you're looking sad now. Your, your mother just died. Your head goes down and now you're crying. That's the director off camera. There's no sound. And you're acting those things out, you know. That's the basics of it all. And that's why I would always say to a young actor, um, get theatrical training. Go in the theater. That's where you're going to learn your craft. Because even in film and television, you're going to have to carry that forward. Gunsmoke. How they, that same company hired me for how the West was when I have no idea. I, say, I wanted to say, did you see the, that last ever? You know. Anyway, they still liked me. But uh, I thought I was so over the top. Like I, so I said, I'm acting for the hundredth row, you know, in a huge theater. You're big. You're doing things a little bit bigger. Camera's all got to be down. And it's just here. It's in the eyes. You don't move your mouth and make all these kinds of, and that's what I was. I still fight that to this day. I don't care how long you've been doing it. It's, you know, you still have to concentrate on the very minimalist. And there's some movie stars and stuff, you know, I remember like Charles Bronson and people like that I used to admire. They never moved a bit. 
but they could tell more in a squint than, yeah, you know. I remember James Arness, who probably is my mentor really in the television business because he, he was instrumental in getting me the pilot of How the West Was Won, which gave me a career. And uh, not just hitting around doing little guest spots on TV episodes. And I got, you know, going on that. And, um, but he would, after 20 years of playing Matt Dillon, he knew everything there was to know about being in front of a camera and learning dialogue. He knew my lines. He knew everybody's lines. Every day. He never, I never saw him flub a line. And it happens to the best of everybody. You, you goof up, your mouth does one thing, and your brain did another. You know, uh, it happens. But in filming, you just stop, okay, let's take that again. You know, whereas in the theater, it goes, it's there. <laughs> you know, the audience just went, did he just screw up? Yeah, he did. Um, Whenever I hear James Arness, I always think of his first role. The thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He used to do that for it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he loved it. He loved it. That was, yeah. I mean, he did some two great science fiction classics from the 50s. Them, about the uh, giant ants, radioactive ants. He was the FBI guy with another young guy named um, Fess Parker who was in that. And they were both in contention for Matt Dillon. You know, they were both being looked at. Oh, oh, well, by Disney to play Davy Crockett. I didn't know Arness was very much in contention for that. In fact, was the favorite until um, when you see the movie Them, Fess Parker plays this pilot that swears he was in the sky with this giant queen ant flying. He was, one, he was the one they wouldn't believe him. And they wouldn't believe him, and he was crazy. They had him in a loony uh, hospital, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. I want to get out of here. I saw it. I swear to God. And um, I didn't know that uh, Walt Disney was looking at both of them. I've only heard that story recently, a few years back. But, uh, but Jim did, I think, one of my favorites of that era was um, uh, The Thing. And it was just a classic movie. It still is. Better, I think, better than the John Carpenter. I, yeah, me too. I own it. Yeah. But he would do The Thing for us every once in a while on the set. Because we had a couple of kids in the McCann family on that. And he'd be in his buckskins. He'd come out of the thing. And little Vicky Shrek would go, Jim, Jim, do the thing. And he'd come up, like, you know, six, seven of him coming at us, wandering his way. You know, it was hilarious. He said he was a giant carrot. <laughs> They, 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 they yeah, he was a veg a, vegetable type That's guy. how they could shoot him. It wouldn't kill him. Yeah, he, he was a carrot. Like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, they, uh, but he, he was instrumental in, in and, so, and I always, I studied him as a young actor when I'd be watching. And because who better, a guy that did, you know, a great role on television. I, I still love Gunsmith. I watch it all the time on INSP, another plug for INSP. Uh, I want to get that in there. Uh, and Gunsmoke plays all the time on that. And, but he, uh, he taught me what it was to be a, a star of your television series. There's a certain responsibility that comes with it. We never had a bad day on How the West Was Won, ever. And that starts from the top down. It can be a bad day. Look, when you're doing a Western, everybody's sharing the same experience. You're hot, you're dusty, the wind is blowing, it's hot or it's cold, and it, you're, everyone's shivering. Nobody's a star then. Everybody's on the same level. We're all getting through this and, and loving it. But, you know, it, it's a great equalizer, the Western. It, it makes everybody be a play on the same stage together and all the technical people and everything. And, um, but Jim worked with everybody in 20 years. Think about it. I mean, you, you watch Gunsmoke now and you see all these young actors who went on to become movie stars and I mean, Betty Davis did it twice. I mean, you have to work with great people. So, and he, he so he knew, every, you know, he was very, uh, I wouldn't say he was a mentor, but he mentored me. Not by, he would consciously, because he was a very um, shy man in many ways about things like that. But I watched and I followed. And when he would give me a little pointer, maybe once in a while, or I'd watch something he'd do, I would do it too. I put that away in my little folder up here of one day if I ever get to be this like this man, um, that's how I'm going to do. So when you're on a box lightener set, I like a happy group of people. I know everybody's name on it, and I call them by their first name. That's what Jim did, things like that. You know, and 
he made it a wonderful experience every day. Even if it was hard and they were long hours and cold or sweltering heat, he did. It's all by, you're the leader and the troops follow you, you know? And he, he'd cut up. Sometimes he would intentionally do something off camera to make us giggle or something laugh. And um, it kept the mood light. We're not curing cancer here. We're entertaining. And he knew that. And he was, I mean, he, it was serious work. No one was more serious. When he told you something and, uh, you know, that big guy told you, uh, I remember I did Red River with him for CBS, a remake of the John Wayne Mon Monty Clift Western in 1987. And when he said, we came to that scene where I take the herd away from him, like in, in the movie, John Wayne turns to Monty Cliff. He looks off at first. He says, one day I'll be there. You'll turn around. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you, Matt. Boy, when Jim Arnest told me, that was like my father saying it to me. And I was looking into those steely blue eyes, and I believed every word of it, <laughs> you know? You, you took him at his word. Start so, looking over your shoulder. Yeah. Like, one day I'll be there. I'm going to kill you. And, uh, and it's that dramatic ending. Yeah. And I just stood there shivering, and then I finally had to sort of back away, all shook. And I tried to put it together and walk away. And that's when the boy becomes the man and has to do the right thing. So uh, I looked to him as a guy that um, not only was he, his decision in casting when he looked at these various um, screen tests of young actors for the role of uh, Luke McCann, um, ABC was pushing this other guy and Jim had casting approval. And, and you can, and you don't have to believe my words, you can go on, uh, you can go on uh, YouTube and find the Television Academy interviews and look up James Arness talks about uh, the casting of Burt Reynolds uh, in Gunsmoke. He did a, several seasons as Quint Asper, the uh, blacksmith. That was one of his very first jobs. And also about casting Bruce Boxleitner in How the West Was Won. And I had never known, this was after he had passed, I, I someone said, have you seen on YouTube the interviews he gave in his, you know, and he did. And he said, no, I kind of like this third guy. He was in the screening room and I was the third guy. And, well, Jim, he's good. Yeah, but, but well, we kind of think number one here is the guy that we're really interested in. I like the third guy. And then he said, it's all you heard was the door slam in the back. <laughs> it was the head of the network. But he said, all right. And so I got the job. And um, that gave me a life. It gave me a career. That one decision, you know, often in life we make point to uh, one person that I have maybe a couple of those people in my life. And Jim was definitely one of them that gave me a direction through a decision they made, you know, and uh, of course I had to pick up on it and carry it through, but you know. It was the right decision. It was the right decision, yeah. And my sons would have never been born. I met my wife on that show, my first wife, and um, it, it gave me a, a whole direction to go. And here I am back at it wearing a cowboy hat again. You know, I never thought I'd ever do a Western again. They kind of went away for a while and now it's very much starting to be in vogue again, which is great.